Hi, guys. Welcome back to my show, My Steps to Sobriety, on podcast and YouTube. With me, your host, Stefan Neff. Very because uh, when just in the in the preamble here before the the recording when we chatted, Naomi used a lot of words that are so ingrained in what I say. Uh, it was spooky. There, there, we seem to be working on very much the same frequencies, which mm -hmm. is uh, quite exciting, but also a bit scary. Uh, now I'm, I've got her here with me and I'm so delighted and grateful for your time and effort to come onto my show, Naomi. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Stefan. Oh, thank you. Naomi, when I read your details and read more about you, your words very much struck a chord with me because you talk a lot about your inner child, an inner child that has its needs that are not fulfilled. And every single story that I've listened to, including my own story, is exactly that. There are, There is a, a very hurt person in there, sometimes physically hurt, sometimes more emotionally, spiritually, or in an abstract way hurt, an inner child. May I ask you, uh, how was your own childhood? Yes, of course. Um, we all have that child, and, and it's to different varying degrees. Some people even carry more wounds and needs and trauma that, uh, that they've had in their childhood. But um, I had a very difficult childhood growing up. Um, I was born with a club foot, uh, which that in itself is very difficult. I had my first surgery when I was three months old and a surgery two years uh, every year after that, uh, which was very painful. But uh, what also was going on in my home at the time was uh, my parents uh, were Jehovah Witness missionaries. Um, yes. And so uh, both families down the line are Jehovah Witness. So this is really all they know. It's really all they know. And although, you know, I speak to my parents and, and we've gotten pretty much somewhat over, I don't, I don't really have a relationship with my father, but I do have one with my mother. And, uh, you know, you have to forgive your, your family because sometimes, like the, the Bible says, they do not know what they do. Uh, we get past... We get past these these uh, beliefs, these patterns of behavior generationally down the line. And I really do believe that that's some of the karma that is talked about. And, you know, sometimes they only you can only teach or so, show someone what you know. You know, and so, you know, I take that into consideration, but that doesn't take away the fact that, you know, it was a very violent and abusive home, you know, uh, with a narcissistic parent. Uh, who he himself had his own issues with anger and 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 disorders himself. Uh, both my families, there is mental disorder, serious mental issues in the family that's never been dealt with because, of course, because of family and religion, everything is kept hush, kept under the carpet, which I believe that that is totally the opposite because what we were mentioning earlier before all of these things, not only do they get passed down, but they get stored in our energetic body. And we are spiritual beings living this human experience. This body is a suit, just like the jacket that you're wearing, just like the shirt that I'm wearing. It is just to cover what's going on in beneath, underneath. And, and that is that we are a spiritual being. And all this energy that we carry is this repressed emotion and pain that turns into illness and addictions. And eventually, you know, uh, when there is emotional neglect uh, and you don't know how to communicate or express these feelings. And, uh, you know, I firmly believe that our school systems and many parents do not have the capacity to teach us or do not give us the life skills that we need in life to succeed. And so most of us reach an age where we cannot cope. We do not know how to deal with our issues. We do not even know how to ask for help or even what help to get. And so since we are so lost inside and we, we don't listen to that voice because we've been listening to everything that we've been taught, it's sort of like a brainwashing of programming because we hear things in school. We hear things at home. We hear things at church. We hear things on the radio, on television. And we take these beliefs as ours and we make them our own. 
And then we forget who we are, what we like, because we're so busy listening to everybody else that we've forgotten ourselves. And so then what happens? We do what everybody else does. We turn to external things to fix the problem inside. And this is, to me, the biggest cause of addiction and self-mutilation and hurt and even hurting others. (laughs) 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 Naomi, do you know how strange it is to see my words coming out of your mouth? Honestly, it is just spooky. You, A, have described me to a T without the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? So it's essentially, I see myself in, in, in 98% of what you have said. Um, it is, I recognize the situation with my parents who did their best, but their values were certainly not values that I nowadays subscribe to, but that is all they knew. That is how they, they tried to do their best. And I, I firmly believe that they try to do their best in their own capacity, in their own ways, as far as my upbringing was concerned. It is, I love it also that you have to a certain degree forgiven them for what they didn't know kind of a thing. And this was a powerful, powerful thing to say, because there is certainly for a long time in my life, there was resentment towards my mother specifically, for for things she had done and the way she had behaved. And it's only nowadays that I accept and, and understand that I was talking about a very distressed and hurt woman with her own inner child that just expressed herself the way she did. So it is it is wonderful words that you say, but you don't just grow up and by the age of 18 have developed that understanding that you have just shown me here. Um, We both are a little bit older than 18, so we've had our fair chance of experiences there. What changed you? What what happened along the lines to, to set you under the path of enlightenment for the lack of a better word that sounds too corny guys out there if you're skeptics and if you're if you're not so much into energy etc choose another word think of something else so obviously something transformed naomi something transformed me what was that or what were those catalysts yeah well i call it like a waking up Uh, All of a sudden we wake up and I I believe it's like waking up, you know, and seeing the matrix or whatever you want to call it, which seeing the matrix is really seeing yourself because uh, every experience that we have really starts here. And that's what people need to understand. We create our realities. We create the world around us. We think we don't because we're like, well, I'm here. This is happening. I don't remember starting this. And it just, it doesn't happen in one day. It's like planting a tree. You plant the seeds and you wait for it to grow. And sometimes what happens is we're unaware that we planted these seeds because they were implanted in us, you know. And when you're told so many times, the average child is told by 18, 100,000 times, no, you can't. So imagine this. uh, We get to a certain age and we have bottled ourselves up that we don't even hear our voice anymore. And that's, that's a whole relearning and a repatterning. So I literally, I had to hit more than rock bottom. Um, I became suddenly ill. I mean, I've had these surgeries, but I was always a very healthy person, very fit. But I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia in 2005. And literally, like, it started knocking me off the ground. But by 2011, I had to have a series of surgeries and I was practically bedridden for seven years. Uh, by this point, uh, you know, I had lost everything. I had lost my career, which I had an amazing career. I had managed to escape my home because I really, I felt like it was, I was a prisoner at 25. When my parents' uh, marriage literally, like, it, they couldn't keep it together to the point that I would just say that there was hospitals, police, everything involved. They couldn't hide it anymore. And even the church said, you know what, these two have to separate. 
Um, so I took that opportunity and I ran. And so I try to make a life of myself. But like we said, these things haunt us because these emotions don't go anywhere. They don't disappear. Just because you change the scenery mm. does not mean that everything else is in the background. It's like a movie set, you know? And so uh, I, I had a relationship, but once again, I got to a point that first I couldn't scale anything because you're only, you can only live a life to the level of degree of mindset that you have, the capacity that you have. So it's like, I love the saying that if you get a million dollars, if you win a million dollars, you better become a millionaire quick because you know what's going to happen. You're going to lose it, you know? So I was able to make a lot of money. I'm not going to say a millionaire, but almost five hundred thousand dollars in a in a in a span of a couple of years, we managed to grow. So it was, but I could never scale more than that, and I started losing it. And of course, I didn't understand why I couldn't do any more. Not in my relationship, not in my personal life, and not in my business life. So I started getting sicker and sicker. And by the time that the surgeries came in. I mean, this was a, a mental affliction that is going on that you can't even explain because you don't even understand what is happening. Basically, your life is falling and you're trying to pick it up, but you understand that that is material. You know, what we have to change is here until you're able to do that. That world is just going to keep on. It's like a movie set. It falls apart, it comes back up. It falls apart, it comes back up, you know? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, so uh, I got to the point, long story short, I, I not only did I not lose my career, lose all my money, but my relationship kept on crumbling. I lost my relationship. Not even that was enough that even our truck was taken with everything we ever owned. And like everything had to be stripped away from me where I had to be literally living in someone else's room, renting someone else's room with literally no credit card, no bank account, no job, no nothing, that I literally had no choice but to ask myself, how did I get here? And when I started asking the right questions is when my life began to change. Did you have the insight to ask these questions or was there someone who held the mirror in front of your face? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I had someone held a mirror in front of my face when um, it it got really bad. My 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 situation was so bad that even my ex girlfriend had to take me back and say, "Okay, you can live in the bedroom till you get your shit together." Basically, you know. So imagine this situation: uh, we've been together uh, way over a decade, and then I'm living in her room, living off the spare bedroom, and she's like, "And I'm gonna date now." So imagine this scenario, like, <clears throat> so of course I began, uh, I had already had a problem with pills. I was completely addicted to Dilaudid, to Oxycontin, to Xanax. I was on Flexerol. I was on Zoloft. I was on Ambien. I was on Cymbalta. I was taking approximately 40 something pills a day. I was, uh, yeah. And then I started with recreational drugs. I started with Molly. I started take, getting Percocet. I started trying, mixing it with alcohol. And I, yeah. And I, I was to a point that I was like, I can't, I can't live this life anymore. I was so lost. And I even tried to take my life. And I ended up in, in the hospital and they had to give me an adrenaline shot. And in this nightmare, I still couldn't see the light. It was an anguish that I can't even describe. I really believe that everything that ever I was ever taught in the Bible was like hitting me all at once because I was like, oh my God, now I understand when John would say he has to beat his body like a slave. When they talk about heaven and hell, this heaven and hell, this, this, this that they talk about, all of this is in the mind. What we have to do is conquer the mind. And I really believe that if you look at the teachings of Jesus Christ, he was talking about that, about the house being the center of you and you having unlimited power and you having your direct connection, connection with God and him believing, him believing in the law of attraction, you know? So what happened is I got home. I had to get back in that room 
And a miracle happened, I would say, because I didn't even remember that years ago I was watching television, one of those nights that I was, you know, having a binge, and I saw a Tony Robbins, uh, yeah, a Tony Robbins infomercial. You know, he's been doing them since like what eighty <laughs> eight. Yeah, and so I don't even know how I got it because I didn't even know they played in the 2000s anymore. But, you know, he was giving away his, his seven DVD set uh, yeah. and video set. So I bought it. And I was cleaning out the closet that night coming back uh, from the hospital. And I found the DVD set. And I spent the entire night listening to it. And I just mm-hmm. spent that, that week locked up in the room. I didn't shower. I barely ate. I didn't do anything. Just listening, listening, and researching online. And that started my journey. That started my journey into sobriety. How beautiful. How beautiful. Uh, Tony Robbins, if you're listening out there, you may have a lot to answer for. Um, I have got your DVDs as well. Um, They were a, uh, a beacon of hope. Uh, for me, they didn't transform me, but I always got so much energy and hope from your from your words. Uh, so good on you, man! Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing what you have created there. The beacon of hope, definitely. Um, having said that, having said there is one thing. I mean, how many DVDs did I listen to, uh, and how many things to then say yes, there is hope, and now hit the bottle again. Um, <laughs> fill my wine up whilst I listen to that. Uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, so between listening and getting the hope and then taking action, now that's a huge step because that's scary. It's okay to listen. That's fine. And they always say everything is half mental. So I yeah. did so many actions up there. But <laughs> funnily enough, yeah, I did do um, yeah. so, and that was intriguing. That's so the that's the conscious mind. Yeah. We're all up for it consciously, but we have the subconscious that is not on board. Exactly. Exactly. And it takes a, a moment or a series of moments when you're so much out of your comfort zone that even you in your hazy mind see that actually this can't continue because either you're dead or in jail or, or you do something about it. No, that's yeah. cool. Um, wonderful. Oh, I'm so pleased. So Tony and you had a bit of a relationship there uh, for a week. And well, after all, he was in your bedroom. Come on. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> you have to admit that. <laughs> so, but then what happened thereafter? Yeah, well, exactly. That got me into the stage where we all get, you know, we watch something, we watch a seminar and we get all hyped up, but then we go back, you know, and sometimes once again, it happens with when we're so unaccustomed to listening to ourselves or doing what we want, that we listen more to others. So basically the world around me was driving me crazy at the point. I couldn't take the fact that my uh, ex was dating. It was driving me insane. I couldn't concentrate. I was, because you know, what happens is you think you need to control the world around you. And that is because you have no control over yourself. You have no domain. Little did I know that was my problem. I wasn't even aware of that. So all I kept thinking is, what am I going to do? How am I going to focus on my work when she's doing all this? I can't concentrate. So I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to start dating someone else. But then I was like, well, I don't want to date someone in person because they're going to take a lot of time. You know, new relationships take so much time and work. And I was like, you know, I have to do my thing. I have to figure out my life. So, you know what? I'll just go online and like meet someone online and have someone, you know, just, just have someone so that, you know, I'm not that... I'm not that crazy or obsessed over what she's doing. I could deal with it and let her do her thing. After all, she's doing me a favor for letting me stay here, you know? So I go online and and one week later, I meet this person, this person that I love now and I actually want to marry, but that's a crazy story because we're not even together right now because this is how the universe works, you know? So this person comes into my life and of course, uh, it becomes a little bit of a nightmare. And uh, 
this person is lying to me. And of course, these are all patterns that we pick up from the from childhood and from the past. And we wonder why we attract certain things in our lives, right? And it's because we have those patterns there and we don't even realize these unresolved emotions, these relationships that were never fixed. And so they keep on manifesting in other faces. You know, they keep on manifesting in other faces. So, you know, I was like, okay, well, I know she's lying to me. I can't pinpoint what it is. So, you know, one of those crazy nights that you have, and and, and it's so funny because I was I was thinking of doing a comedy about it because we all know about that little green dot. You know, when someone's online, <laughs> you're able to know if that person's online or on the app. And I was like, you know, she told me she's going to bed, but yes, she's online. And funny as it is, in trying to, and, and I know this sounds silly, I never did anything like this in my life, but it goes to show because I always had everything under control. This was the first time in my life that I couldn't control anything. You see, every relationship, every business relationship that I ever had, I controlled. That's why I could never get on any further because the minute that I knew I couldn't control something, I would just back out. I backed down on million dollar deals and I would say, oh, I don't trust him. I don't trust. No, it's because I knew I couldn't trust myself. Right. See, but these are all things that, that happen in our subconscious. So, so here I am, and I'm trying to figure out who she's talking to. And I assume that it's this one person. I'm looking at this person. And when I'm sitting there, it's 5 o'clock in the morning. I haven't slept in two days trying to figure out who it is that she's talking to at 4 o'clock in the morning. Not me. You know, like a child. And all of a sudden, it hits me. And I look at this person and this girl, I mean, you see me, I have tattoos, piercings, you know, I just, I dress casual and white beaters. And here's this woman, beautiful with straight hair in a suit and her life, her career, everything is in order. And I start looking at the past nine years, you know, the troubles that I've had that I talk about in my book, but it's it's been even problems, legal problems, problems with but jail, I mean, I, I literally went down a, a, a road that you would never think that you would. And that's why I'm obsessed with neuropsychology, neuroscience and the mind, because I believe that like every other muscle, that is a muscle too, that can degenerate to a point of darkness. And this is the heaven and hell that we talk about. And there is no good and evil. We all have that capacity within us. We have the good and we have the evil, the little angel and the little devil on our shoulder that's always talking to us. It's just which one are we going to feed the most? And when you have so much toxicity and then you include substances uh, that are not natural because they're chemically made, you know, one thing is smoking a little weed or having a mushroom, but all these pharmaceuticals, our human body is not meant to absorb so many things. It just messes your mind even more. And, and you become disassociated, you know? So I, I think that, that my disassociation was so big. And at this moment, sitting there, it all of a sudden hit me. And that was, I believe, the first time. And that was August 2017. That was the first time that it hit me. And I started questioning, who am I? What am I doing? What do I want? And if I died right now, would this, would this, be the memory of me? Is this what I want my family and friends and those who love me to see me as? And that was the moment. So I, I thank this woman every day uh, because I believe that had she been like everyone else compliant, I would not be here. I would not be here. And that was my start. <laughs> You're so right. You're so right as far as all the the emotions are concerned and it's intriguing how your mind worked the search for the eternal search for control because that's what we want we want to control our our circumstances we want to be in control and i see that every day in in my work as an anesthetist because here i am sending people off to sleep and they have to give up the control and for some of them it is one of the most scary things they could ever think about it's typically teachers nurses doctors where we are completely in control of our environment at any moment in time take a teacher in the classroom for example 
and to suddenly give up that control. Wow. And that is just one of the many emotions out there. For you, that was one trigger and one driver with regards to your actions. But there are so many other emotions out there that are driving our behavior. And these, and these emotions are, are not something that is on the forefront of your mind. This is reptilian brain stuff. This is stuff that goes on without you being aware of it. Yet, what are the implications? You are out there either succeeding and you think, wow, how did I do that? Or on the flip side, far more commonly, destroying yourself, destroying relationships, destroying possibilities, opportunities. If you look back at your life and think, wow, this was a really great opportunity and you blew it, why the hell? And it is because of an emotion or a set of emotions. I, I didn't realize that up until when someone held the mirror in my face and that was what rehab was all about. Up until seven years ago, I... I tried to to work with that supercomputer. I didn't have the user manual. So I tried to press a few buttons. And after a while, you figure a little bit out, okay, hey, if I do that, that, and if I use some alcohol, ooh, I become all much more suave and much more. Hmm. And it was all these kind of shit associations that you're going to put in your head uh, because you're, you're working with the crap that you have been given uh, from your parents, then the crap that you made up yourself. And suddenly you've got this construct that you have created. This is all you're doing because you are true. Yeah, that's right. There's not someone else creating that for you. No, no, no. That was you. So take ownership there. And the important bit is then that you get the chance hopefully through karma in a, in a good way that someone whacks you over the head with a two by four and you realize, whoa, that can't continue like that. And in my case, it was, it was the rehab. It was four weeks in which I have had to face my emotions. Emotions was the most dreaded, dreaded 10 o'clock meeting in the morning because it would be sitting around in a circle, no sunglasses, no hat, nothing in your hands. And we are just talking emotions and everyone hated it. And nowadays I look back and I know why we hated it so much because this was the driver for all that was dark and destructive and mean out there i don't want to use the, the the words from the from the bible i uh, hell and devil very much come to my mind but these are not the the fire and brimstone pitchforks kind of stuff no this is what you create in your head and i think that's so beautiful what you have described there naomi it is yeah. Yeah. Hmm? We're trying, most of us, if you notice, as human beings, you know, we can we can only experience one emotion at a time. And basically, on both ends, we have fear and we have love, you know. And what we're trying to do as humans is we're always either trying to run away from something or we just are trying to run to pleasure. We just want to feel good. But always, always it's for the same reason, to escape what we're feeling inside. And the point is that we can't escape it. We need to embrace it. And, and what you said to me is so interesting because that's what I say. Everything that you buy in this world comes with a manual except us. And I think that we should come with a manual. <laughs> Shit, yeah. And it would be a very big one. <laughs> it would be a very big one. It would be way bigger than the Bible. Okay, I think the Bible is missing a couple of volumes. Okay, but 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 the thing is that we can we can because through personal development, through the experiences of people who have had these experiences, the heartaches, the lessons, we can help further and younger generations so that they don't have to go through what we have to go through. You see, that's the point of life. It's not fixing, not just fixing our generational line, but fixing society as a whole. And how do we do that? We start with youth. So, okay, so we didn't get it. We didn't get the memo. But how about giving them the memo now that we have the memo and now that we know what the memo is and now that we know what it works? Like you said, 
when you try to figure it out yourself, you just waste time, money, heartache, and energy. And as human beings, you know, we only have a certain amount of energy. That's it. That's it. We're like a computer. We're a quantum computer, okay? So you just think about your phone. After a certain amount of hours, you've got to plug it in. So it's maximizing your time and your energy, you know, because it's, you know, so we have to teach our youth. Yeah, we have to. It's it's our duty. I could not agree more. And I will talk briefly about not briefly we will talk now about that but i mean there are two things i want to say firstly i've got two teenagers and unfortunately uh, they are uh in at stages in their life where they sort of listen but certainly not to the to the extent that i would like them to and they listen to other people, but just not to that. So therefore, uh, it is, if you are out there and say, but, 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 my kids, maybe it's not necessarily that you as mommy and daddy uh, have to play that role. I think there needs to be other people out there who are speaking to our kids and not just leading them into crappy ways, but also into good ways. And I think Naomi, you are you are exactly uh, such a person, isn't it? Uh, tell me about your work now, because so, well, actually, before we go there, 2017, you had that insight, mm-hmm. and you had that journey with Tony Robbins, that one week of hidden love in your bedroom there, but then not much changed there, at least in your actions. So you're now 2017 another new insight, another new catalyst. How did you go about it there? What changed your behavior, not just your thoughts? It's funny. Well, it didn't even start for me there. I thought, okay, well, I want to be the best woman I could be for this woman. I want to give her the life that she wants. She's had such a hard life. You know, I want to make her rich. I want to give her this and that. And so, you know, at the same time, I'm thinking I want to be a better person. So here I am and I signed up for seminars and I took a a Mind Valley seminar. I signed up with the Tony Robbins and Dean Graciosi uh, seminar. And little by little, uh, I started asking the right questions. But I'm not going to tell you it's easy because you know this yourself. When you have spent 35 years living one way, we are computers. We live off patterns. Your body, it, it goes in phases. You have your conscious mind. Then you have your subconscious mind. And then you have your body memory. And if you know anything about uh you know, John Dispenza, if you know anything about epigenetics, neuropsychology, neural pattern behavior, and all of this, you understand that, that these programs take their course. And they say generally, half the time you've been, you know, if you've been doing something for 10 years, if you've been doing drinking for 10 years, it's going to take you five years to get rid of that pattern and replace it with another one. And now I believe we can speed that up. But understand the numbers. Understand the numbers. So I was literally like going through hell most of the time uh, in the mornings. I would start off and I would spend a good three or four hours overcoming myself, uh, wanting to run back to take a pill, do a drug, or just go back in bed, or just say it's too difficult and not want to deal with it. So a big part of the battle the first year and a half was overcoming myself. And the funny thing is that. You know, most of us can't succeed in life because we can't overcome ourselves. You know, this is why 80% of society is in the situation that they are at, you know, and it it, it comes all because of all these patterns of belief. So mm-hmm. that was the first, that was the first process. And, and I started asking myself the same question repeatedly, like in tears every day, I would ask myself, my God, what would I have needed to learn when I was young, when I was a teenager, so that I could have overcome my challenges so that I wouldn't be here? Like, I mean, honestly, how many signs, and I talk about it in my book, every sign that I missed, you know, what would I needed to have learned? And so I started putting a course together. and, And this is why I tell people that, you know, find something that you do every day, that you love to do and that you would do for free and then make that a business. And this is why, you know, we'll talk about what I, what I help teens do, yeah. because I really believe that, that this is the age of the entrepreneur. 
and personal development and growth and, and a change in the universe and humankind. I know that everything's breaking, but I feel like what's breaking is just like we're breaking and we're waking up as people. Okay. I believe that the systems that have been created are crumbling. That is the political system, the government system, the church, the medical, the healthcare. All of those systems don't work. And they're collapsing. You know why? Because they can't keep that facade anymore. Even if they have control, they can't keep it any longer because now we're trying to create our own reality. So we're questioning that reality and it's crumbling. So we need more people to believe. We need more people to believe, more people to take power, the power back, take control back and start thinking for themselves and doing for themselves. And this is what I tell people. We're all having to work so hard now. We didn't want to, but look at life 20 years ago to now. We're all having, most of us have to have two jobs, some three jobs. You don't have a one family income anymore. Most people have two or three people working in a home. Mm -hmm. So if you're working that hard already, you know, before in the 80s, yeah, you could have a good life and, and have your nice nine to five and still make a decent living and still have the vacation, but you can't have that life anymore. So if you have to work so hard anyways, I say screw that and work for yourself, work that hard for yourself. And this is why I wanna teach young people self-discipline because we live in a society that has no discipline and is used to instant gratification. And this is what's killing our society. A lack of discipline and a, I want it now. We don't wanna wait for anything. We want, we wanna take the magic pill, you know? Everyone wants to have the surgery for the tummy tuck. I'm not saying don't have it, but don't think that you don't have to go to the gym and exercise every day. <laughs> this, is this is why the society is crumbling and, and we need to fix it by fixing ourselves. You want to see change out there? Stop going on strike and start working on yourself. Start to, Stop demanding other people to change. The system to the government, they're not going to change. They're not going to change. What you have to do is you change, you find your way, and screw them. It's going to fall. It's going to fall anyways. Ooh, you're a dangerous woman. You're a dangerous <laughs> woman. You're passionate. You have got a vision. You're not afraid to speak your mind. Well, it was a real pleasure to have known you because you're going to disappear somewhere because the, the, the society in which you live, all the powerful people who are losing the pedestal on which they are standing, I don't think they are so happy with what you are saying. I can't imagine that the church is so happy with your attitude towards them. Um, you, there will be a lot of dark people coming out of the woodworks because they are not willing to change themselves, but they are hell-bent to keep their status quo. So, oh, please, but, but, but what you're saying is so true. It is absolutely true. And if I, these are the truest words that can be spoken out there. And you are fearless in the way you have spoken them. And I congratulate you on that because it's exactly the way I see that our, our society is heading. Unfortunately, you guys are really so far out there as far as the American society is concerned with all of its its strata that mm. uh, you are there. We in the in some parts of the rest of the world, like New Zealand, we are not yet close to that, but we're probably not so far off either. We are yeah. still relatively comfortable uh, whilst with you, everything is falling apart. Well, Stefan, one in five teenagers commit suicide here in the United States from ages 12 to 25. Sorry, what that, was that figure, please? One out of five teenagers are committing suicide every year in the United States from the ages 12 to 25. To me, that's an epidemic bigger than what's going on now. One in five, one 20%. In five. Yes. Are and committing, is, and when you say committing suicide, that that with that you're referring to uh, attempting suicide. No, 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 not attempting. Attempting suicide is is a higher rate. No, they are killing themselves. One in five teenagers are killing themselves in the United States. Why this is not in the papers every day, I do not know. Seventy seventy two percent of our teens are on some form of prescribed medication. 
All our kids are being said that they have ADD. There is a serious problem. And this is why, yeah, I have made it my mission because we want to fix the system, but we need to take care of our youth. Shit, yeah. Uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, the, figure, the figure is unbelievable. Um, but uh, it is like everything. I mean, for crying out loud, the, the incidence of chemical addiction is one in three. And yet, when people are uh, hearing that figure, they say, no way, no way. And in reality, it is, actually. Thank you very much. Uh, we are trying to pretend that everything is hunky-dory, and it is nothing like that. Wow. Tell me about your, your, your passion now. So teens are close to your heart. And you have created that course for teens. Tell me about the, the, your work that you're currently doing. And tell me about your vision, where you are heading now. What is your dream? How do you want to go about making this a better place for other teenagers? Well, I'm creating, a, well, I have courses for teens uh, to help teens become entrepreneurs. Because I believe that working from home is the future. Uh, right now, 60% of the businesses that exist worldwide started in their own homes. People don't know these numbers. And uh, home-based businesses uh, make 70% uh, more than brick-and-mortar businesses. And when uh, regular businesses usually close within three to five years, if you have a home business after three years, you will be making six figures. And these are all estimates that are, are I, I've gone them from the paper myself. So these are really good numbers. And as we know, we cannot count on the regular world anymore for a job. You know, jobs used to be safe before. You used to get a contract. You were, you were guaranteed a pension, but that system doesn't exist anymore. So we have to create we have to create systems for ourselves. And that's why I want to help youth do that by finding something that they love, you know, and uh, half of my course is mindset because you understand that it is breaking all of these patterns of fear that we go picking up. Fear is what stops most of us from doing anything that we want, you know. It's the biggest monster. Sometimes we're so afraid to do something or take an action. And once we do it, those that have past that boulder, we can tell everybody else, you know what? The monster was the fear. The actual action wasn't as bad. Correct. So true. Absolutely true. 100%. And it is the, the first step. I, I remember as a, as a little boy standing on top of a jumping board in, in a public swimming pool, three meters high, and it looked like the Grand Canyon down there uh, to jump into the water. And I was thinking, oh, my God, how do I do that? How do I do that? And I stood there and I stood there. And what I didn't realize, something in me made me want to do it. And I actually just leaned forward, leaned forward, leaned forward until I reached a point of no return. And I had to take action. And suddenly I remember actually as a little boy how liberating that was to be now in free fall I had to do something, I jumped in, and I had to do the first head first uh, jump from three meters. And guess what? Nothing happened. I did it, and I thought, wow. It's only now, what, close to 50, uh, yeah, close to 50 years later, that I actually remember that liberation, that taking action uh, as, as the, the, as, as a beautiful thing to do you yeah. you have to go out there do it all yourself and it is the fear is something that will be there and let's quickly talk about that i talked about that in my book and and in in many of my podcasts fear is normal fear is good it is i i i want you guys to embrace fear because it puts you on alert there is something there uh, that wants you to survive. And in general terms, surviving is quite a good thing. So, therefore, it, it is, you know, 50,000 years ago, it was genetically imprinted into you that, you know, fear is good. But yeah. if, it's okay if there is a horde of people with spiky things coming at you, or if there's a bear in front of you, fear is what you need to survive. 
but fear is still there. Now, fear to write an email, fear to get out of the bed because the day is so overwhelming. Now, that has no longer got any kind of virtue, any kind of sense. Mm-hmm. So you need to, to learn what fear is. See what it feels for you. How does it taste? How does it feel? How does it make your, your, your skin tingle? Experience yeah. it consciously 100% and then say, thank you very much, fear. Now I remember how you feel. Now fuck off to the side because you're not helping me. Right now I need to focus on the steps that need to be done and move forward. So please don't, don't somehow create fear is bad. Fear is good, but it doesn't necessarily help us at all times in our modern day life. Exactly. Um, we all have fear and, and people think that courage is something that you're born with. Mm-hmm. No, courage is something that you acquire by pushing past your fear. And the way that I, I teach people is by explaining this. Everything is the association you give it. Uh, when you're very excited for a vacation or something, you feel that same adrenaline running through your body than you feel when you have to have a test or if you're being chased by a cat or anything like that. It's the same chemical feeling. It's the association. So this is what I try to teach people. It's what association are you giving it? And I and I tell people, write things down. What association are you giving it? Because that is usually it. Change the picture. Once again, I go back to the Hollywood. Just change the picture and say, okay, so I am feeling this adrenaline, this excitement, or this fear. You see, switch it to excitement. And you'll see how it'll change. So pretty much our life is based on associations, on perceptions, and on beliefs. You know, And it is, once again, becoming self-aware and taking these things and saying, okay, well, This perception, this belief, this idea, this experience doesn't suit me, does not suit this situation right now. And if we think about our fears, you will see that 80% of the fears you've had your entire life never came to be. (laughs) So true. So when you take all that into account, and another thing that I tell my students We are taught, at least in our American society, that failure is bad, that failure is humiliating. Now, imagine if Einstein would have thought that. Can you imagine? You try something a couple of times and everyone's, all right, bro, well, you tried, man. Good good for trying. Good for trying. Get on there again. Uh Get on there again. Albert Einstein did it a thousand times. Do you think he felt like a failure? No. No, and not. guess guess what? Guess what? Let's say you have got a child, and let's say you have he is on the toddler stage. So he is just trying to get up and trying to walk. And what happens? One step, two step, bump. Oh my god. You try again. One step, two step, bump. That's it. No more walking for you, young man. I mean, <laughs> you're you're a failure. Come on, stop walking. You're a failure. You would never say that. Never, never. Yet in our lives. We are convincing ourselves, oh, my God, I failed here. I, fa- I failed twice. You oh, like, my God. You How said it. the child. Yeah. You, the child, the <laughs> child, when he falls, he doesn't say, oh, I can't walk, Daddy. I'm not going to try then. I'm just not meant to walk. It's just not for me. It's for other people. You see, he can do it. Yeah, that's because he's better at walking, but just walking is not my thing. You know how many times I've heard that? No. No, the child, you see, we don't have that because we're born into this experience with no fear. We're pure love. And then all this gets put inside us, all these programs and these patterns, because that child gets up. And, how many humans do you know that never, I never know, I decided to stop walking. Not one, not one of us said, you know what, I gave up then. No, what happens to us? These are the questions we have to start asking ourselves. Okay, so something happened that was outside of me because the in me, the real me, source, the the unlimited being that I am with the capacity that I have, I know I can. It's just teaching ourselves again. It's like a rebirth. It's a waking up. It really is. And I love it that you're doing that work with teenagers. When I came out of rehab, 
I thought, wow, these were the best four weeks in my life because they taught me so much. And the next question then I ask myself, why the hell don't they teach that in school? And for me, I literally am nowadays of the opinion that every 17, 18 year old should get mandatory four weeks in rehab doing exactly the hard work. Um, and when I say 12 steps, and, and I use that framework uh, in, in my book, I mean a system of approaching your inner problems. And the 12 steps, if you do them in a, in a sensible, logical way, then they will help you a hell of a lot to recognize where the problems within you lie how much family beliefs that that were imprinted onto you in, in at a very early stage, how much they had to do with things amongst many other things. So I strongly believe, yes, we need to work with the teenagers to reduce the kind of bullshit that they're growing up with. And that's certainly if there's one regret if there's one thing that i would have loved to have happened in my life is that there would have been better role models and when i say role models with that i mean people who had been at rock bottom had learned from it and were now willing to talk honest about their emotions about their feelings and how they overcame things in the 80s that wasn't really done uh, 70s, 80s, that was, you had to live a certain kind of life and and that was handed down to me. And nowadays it is so different. So I yeah. love it. I love it that you, that you feel the passion to create a better life for those people out there who want to listen to you. And so, I mean, how do, how do you find your victims? I mean, how do you... <laughs> Well, we're, we're right now, we're working on our first biggest project, which is the Team Warrior Summit. And it's being held uh, from October 23rd to the 25th. Uh, we were planning it in person, but since everything has happened, we decided, well, you know what? We're not going to cancel it. We're going to do it online. Cool. So we're having our first, yes, uh, Team Warrior Summit online. And um, we have eight speakers, and basically, this is what we're talking about, these subjects. Uh, how to deal with your emotions, repressed emotion, emotional overwhelm, uh, how to find your why, how to find your purpose, how to develop self-awareness, how to become self-aware, how to find your self-worth, how to develop a positive and winning mindset, and how to deal, because a lot of us have trauma and abuse, uh, whether it's emotional abuse, psychological abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. We've all dealt with some abuse or neglect. And we have someone who will be also discussing that, who has cool. had these personal experiences and, and has had cool. several in that. And so these are the little things that we hope to do uh, to start creating a change. Because, you know, you, you, I believe in the law of attraction just like you. I don't want to be looking at the world all day because that's what I did for many years and saying, oh, this doesn't work and just be complaining. You know, I will do my best to create a system that I feel good about and, and in that way help people, you know, and try to not look away. And I believe that's what the law of attraction is about. And I have people that say, oh, so you don't care what's going on in the world. Of course I do. That's why I'm doing this. Huh. But sitting there and watching it and talking about it is really not going to do very much about it. I mean, it, it, it's nothing going to change for me or for them, you know. But if we start thinking together and coming together as a community, like you said, and sharing our stories, that's why I love coming on podcasts and, and talking to people like you, Stephen, because I believe that this is how we're going to change the world. Honestly, this is how it's going to happen. One person at a time, one talk at a time, you that's know. Right planting seeds and these seeds might not immediately grow they might just fester for a little bit and and then one day someone will will suddenly have that eye-opening experience and then they might think back onto onto our our talk here 
And from a time frame, today is, you know, what is it today? 15th of July here. Um, that might happen in August. And then they think, bloody hell, wasn't there a summit coming up? And that might be the start of their journey moving forward. And how does it come about? Because two people like us are passionate enough, are hopeful enough. We have got the vision and the energy to turn to turn a vision into reality. And that's what we do. We're bouncing around ideas and, and energy. And hopefully this energy is, is coming through the speakers out there and through the, through the screens out there and it touches the people and that they say, wow, if these two numb nuts can do it, then exactly. hopefully, that's right. You know, it, there, there might be still hope. <laughs> exactly. If, if I could get it together, if I could get it together. You know, people talk about, okay, let's talk about your traits and your qualities. Well, I have pretty crazy traits. Like, I am I'm obsessive. I am impulsive. I am a curious person. I am adventurous to the point of taking too many risks, you know? But when you learn to balance yourself, when you learn to get to know yourself, then you're able to, you know what I'm saying? And exactly. to manage, and that's what I tell people. Look, if I can do it, if I've made so many mistakes and I can figure it out, Believe me, you can do it. You're going to be a rock star. You're, you're going to be a rock star. You got this. You got this, you know? <laughs> oh, Naomi, you are a fantastic woman. Uh, it is. And you have had a long journey. So have I. And I think there, uh, it's, my shout goes out to all the broken people out there. Because uh, Naomi and I, we're nothing nothing more nothing less than you are now guys it just takes a moment of putting the pause button and actually thinking the right question yes how did i get here but ask not oh why me why me oh poor me poor me poor me another one uh, no it is the uh, it is the well what can i do right now to get myself that little bit better. What can yeah. I, what is the little step that I can take right now? And if your listeners feel broken, um, I want them once again, like we said, perspective to try to think, okay, because sometimes like you said, we play the victim. We play the victim instead of why me, then say, hmm, why me? Just change it around a little bit and think when I literally, my life began to change when I decided to stop saying, why is this happening to me? And I started saying, this is happening for me. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It could be a breakup. It could be a loss of a business. It could be a loss of, of some part of health that you have to ask yourself because even health is all stress and emotionally related. Why? Is this happening? Because when you start saying things are happening for you, then this is how the brain works. You have to remember, we're dealing with a prehistoric creature. And since most of us has, have, have experienced so much trauma, when we are in stress, our prefrontal cortex immediately just goes whoop. And now your reptilian brain is in charge, okay? But we have to learn how to manage this creature. And this is a fascinating creature that wants to find solutions. So when you start asking the right questions, the brain immediately wants to find an answer. So when you're saying, why has this happened to me? Or I'm such a loser. Don't worry. Your brain's going to give you a thousand reasons uh -huh. why it happened to you bad and why you're such a loser, because that's what it does. Now you reframe the question. And you start asking yourself, this is happening for me. Why did I get sick? What am I not seeing? This breakup happened. This doesn't happen in a day. What am I missing? What did I not see? Oh, my God. This is why it happened. Lesson right there. You just transcended, my friend. You just transcended because life is like a video game. You got to play and get really good. You know that it doesn't matter how many times you play if you do not play that level well or get the points, you're not going to go to the second level. Life is the same. Life is exactly the same. And we're not seeing that the video game is the lesson. The things that keep happening to us, those are the little things in the video game that we have to conquer and that we have to start stop saying this is happening to me because then you know what's going to keep on happening. Life is like 
you didn't get it, I'm going to send you another person. Oh, you didn't get it? You moved to another state? Don't worry. I'm going to send it over there. We keep on trying to change the scenery when we have to change this. Uh, you know? No. For, but the problem, of course, is some of us are playing Monopoly here and to get to a different level. Uh, at the moment, 2020, for many of us, is sort of Jumanji level six, master level. Um, so the challenges might be huge, but that doesn't change. That doesn't change what Naomi and I are saying. You guys can ask the right questions and suddenly answers will come and you might be surprised about them because you didn't expect them whatsoever, but it's well worth listening. So ask the right questions and move from there. Naomi, if people want to get hold of you, if people want to to know more about the summit or more about your work, how can they do that? Well, I'm Naomi Nye, N-A-O-M-I-N-Y-E, and I am on Facebook and Instagram, but I have a website, uh, which is thnnetwork.org, and our Teen Warrior Summit website will be up on August 1st. So that's www.teenwarriorsummit.com, and that will be up on August 1st. And we hope that you guys come and watch our... We're even going to have performers. We're having musical performances. We're doing <laughs> a little scenes and everything. So it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so I really hope you, you know, your viewers start tuning in and, and get to see what we're going to do. Absolutely. And we're going to put links down there. So I have a look below in the in the description of the video and of yes. the podcast. So you will be able to conveniently and easily get uh, to Naomi's uh, ventures at the moment. Naomi, I'm so grateful for the time you were able to spend. And it is such a beautiful thing to listen to you. The energy is sort of coming out of the, the screen here. And it's lovely to listen to your voice. Uh, you're a beacon of light. And we need more beacons like you in these rather confused times. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your passion with me today thank you for having me Stephen. it's been a lot of fun talking with you <laughs> look after yourself and you guys out there take heart press the stop button look at your environment look at yourself and think okay what can i do right now to make this a little bit of a better world and head towards a life that is so fantastic that yesterday becomes jealous of today Look after yourself, guys. Bye.